going to do? I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Fields. We are with you for the next half hour to shatter the headlines, like the seismic shockwaves of two royal names. You are with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Well, uh, quite a day. Uh, basically, uh, Alex, uh, Piers Morgan last night on Talk TV uh, put the cat among the pigeons. Uh, he took the decision to uh, reveal the two names of the royal family, members of the royal family who appeared in the Dutch version of Omid Scobie's book, Endgame, and were named as the two members of the royal family who speculated about the color of unborn Archie. Uh, let's uh, remind ourselves of this seismic moment last night. I don't believe any racist comments were ever made by any of the royal family, and until there is actual evidence of those comments being made, I will never believe it. But now we can start the process of finding out if they ever got uttered, what the context was, and whether there was any racial intent at all. Like I say, I don't believe there was. The royals who are named in this book are King Charles and Catherine, Princess of Wales. Well, that's an extraordinary moment, uh, and we have to be very, very uh, careful here. But it's, no one is saying, mm. uh, Piers isn't saying, we're not saying that King Charles and uh, Catherine are remotely racist. In I don't believe in it. Fact, in moment. fact, we've been through the cuttings, we've been, been through their entire life stories. There is no evidence of either of them ever being right. racist. However, for whatever reason, their names have turned up only in the Dutch version right. of this book. And now, no one knows how. Yeah, and, and, and at first, uh, Omid Scobie, the author, was saying, well, this was due to some translation problem. As I keep saying, the translation into Dutch of your name or my name, Kevin O'Sullivan, Alex Phillips, is Alex Phillips and Kevin O'Sullivan. Mm -hmm. So there aren't different... There's not a translation problem in terms of the names. Uh, Piers took this decision because he felt the British public had a right to know. If the people in Holland were discussing it openly and had these names revealed, why shouldn't we know them as well? Yeah. Uh, but we have to stress there is no suggestion that either King Charles or Catherine have ever been raised. I mean, actually, it takes a lot of the poison out of the speculation of this story, which is skidded around like a bar of soap in the shower, hasn't it? You know, from that Oprah interview to the later interview of Tom, Tom Bradby, who made these comments, when were they made? Yeah. You know, the accounts from Harry and Meghan, frankly, have been all over the place when it comes to this. And then when the names finally came out, I think most people just went, hold on. King Charles, the guy who is accused of being the most woke king ever, the man who at his coronation insisted, rather than being named defender of the faith, which is a, a protocol of um, mm -hmm. the royal coronation, he wants to be known as the defender of all faiths. The man who backs a multitude of charities representing countries, institutions yeah, all over point. the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it is utterly mad to think that King Charles is anything but a warm-hearted, open and accepting person and usually comes under criticism for it. Okay. As for Kate, I mean, come on, does anybody really mm. believe that but, Kate is going to ha hold any sort of uh, unpleasant there's going to be like a lot of There's going to be a lot of discussion today about was Piers right to do this? I think he was uh, for uh, a number of reasons. First off, I think he's right. The public have a right to know. Uh, wh why on earth are the people of Holland mm. able to discuss these two names and we're not? It's ridiculous. We pay for the royal family after all. Secondly, I think this was uh, an important moment because it, it takes the pressure off uh, King Charles and mm. Kate because 
Accusing those two people of being racist is frankly absurd. Mm, it undermines the accusation in itself. And also, uh, if we just left it hanging in the air mm. and didn't name them, uh, the entire royal family are in yeah. the spotlight. We, people exactly. will go, was it Edward, was it Anne, was it, you know, was it the Queen, and so on and so forth. So I think that uh, this was a moment where light was cast upon a kind of confusing exactly. darkness. Exactly, and I think as a result as well, it sort of prevents the acolytes of the Montecitos, the ones who want to run down the royal family, who want to slander it, who want to besmirch it, who want to accuse it of yeah. being out of step, old-fashioned, having toxic views. It takes their power mm. off away, yeah. doesn't it? It takes that stranglehold away from them because the world suddenly goes, oh, what? So this is supposed to be the story. A, do we believe it? And B, I mean, come on. Seriously? We don't believe it. That's the point. That's the point. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as I say, I think that Piers has done something, something very important uh, yeah. today. Uh, Talk TV, of course, is leading this uh, via uh, Piers' uh, extraordinary moment last night. Uh, as yet, the rest of the media are yet to follow suit. Mm. Uh, but I think they'll have to because it's important to stress that, you know, by revealing that these names in the frame yeah were, of all people, King Charles and Catherine, the Princess of Wales, in and of itself, that allegation to those allegations are just absurd to They're me. They're so absurd. But do you know what else is quite fascinating about this? Never before have I seen such a furore being made on social media and then we were able to broadcast um, this revelation. The newspapers, however, not following suit. And even before we came on point. air, legal conversations. And it actually goes to show quite how litigious things have become. The royal family who have never sued a newspaper in their life. And that all changed, didn't it, with uh, Prince Harry's Terrible. litany of litigation against the press and how it's very much changed things yeah. actually in this day and age when it comes to discussing things relating yeah. to these two, you know, some of they're very good, aren't they, about uh, doing interviews and saying, well, we're not going to really say, but this kind of happened. We don't want to name any names. Well, they, they... We didn't call it racism, but they did ask about the colour of the skin. You know, they're very good at putting those sorts well, they, of like this started, didn't out it, there. With, that, with the uh, explosive Oprah Winfrey interview. Mm. Where they first revealed this, and if you remember, she so like Megan said, "Oh yeah, I'm worried about my the color of the baby." Yeah, so I oh, and and remember, remember, Oprah went, "They did what? They did what?" Boom. Well, if they were just speculating on the color of mm. the unborn baby, that's not racist for a right. kickoff. But of course, it has been framed that. Uh, they expressed concern over the colour of right. the baby. Now, that arguably if, is racist, right. but I don't believe that for a second. And then, of course, what naturally happens, which they would have known would happen, is the whole global media it explodes with this idea that we've got a racist royal family. Yeah. Those headlights run on and on and on and on, and the Montecito say nothing, mm. nothing, until Tom Badby interviews Prince Harry and says in the Oprah then interview, reels, reels you back. accuse members of your family of racism. The Duke goes, oh, no, I didn't. The British press said that. The British press said that. Did Meghan ever mention that they're racist? And we're like, uh, hold on, dude, couldn't you have actually intervened when all the headlines said that and said, uh, no, Meghan never said they're racist. Couldn't you have, I don't know, put something on your Instagram account? Used one of your many moaning Netflix series or the book like Spare or your other sort of whiny interviews to point out quite deliberately that under no circumstances are your family racist? You didn't. No, you let this grow on They, they, they lobbed a the grenade. She, uh, Meghan lobbed a grenade in that interview. You and she mm -hmm. wrote loads of There's also claims that she wrote to the king uh, about the royal racist, which now, uh, the alleged royal racist, I should stress, which now turns out to be right. the king himself. Uh, absolute Funny. ridiculous accusation. But I think it is now. I mean, they, uh, Harry and Meghan, the gruesome twosome in Montecito, have denied helping Omid Scobie right. in this book, just as they denied helping him in his first book, Finding Freedom, and later Meghan had to say, uh, due to one of her legal mm. actions, actually, I did help Omid Scobie. So I think it's incumbent today, and we'll be covering this, obviously, on Crosstalk this afternoon, and so we'll talk TV throughout the day. I think it's incumbent of uh, Harry and Meghan to say something today. They really yeah, have to I, say Yeah, well, that. I think so. And, of course, Piers Morgan is going to be back on Talk TV tonight at 8pm to mop up the rest of this. And I think well, it's I think, going to I think we'll all be mopping it up all day. Yeah, get your uh, mop at the ready, uh, Kev. But surprising though it is, Alex, uh, there are other things going on in the well, world.
Thankfully, uh, we're going to move on from this now. <laughs> well, we're not later, we're not. <laughs> no. Nobody's going to be moving on from this story. It's the big story of the day. But uh, over in uh, Israel, we've got the terrible news last night. That, right. Uh, according to Hamas, poor little 10-month-old, uh, the, the baby... Jafir uh, Bibas. Jafir Bibas uh, has been killed, along with, I think it was her... her his Four-year-old brother. brother and and her, his mother. That's what Hamas are saying. Israel oh, investigated. Yeah. Hamas are saying that they were killed by a, an Israeli bomb. Uh, the IDF, the Israeli Defence Force, says it's investigating. Uh, or, I mean, I would say... This horrifically and horribly has the aura of truth about it, that they are dead. And what a tragic story that is. Ten yeah. months old, a baby. It's utterly heartbreaking. Of course, that this was the picture, actually, when the hostages were first taken, when those atrocities were committed on the 7th of October, those two wee little redhead boys and their mum. You know, that picture went around the world and we are learning, potentially, that they are now dead. And what is so sick and sad about all of this, and it shines a really grim light on Hamas, is they know the power of of these hostages, the capital that a little 10-month-old baby has mm -hmm. to negotiate more arms, to negotiate money, to negotiate a longer truce so you can regroup and, 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 and you know, begin to be a, a re-offensive. They know very cynically what the life of that little baby is worth to them, forgetting what it's worth to the parents, the relatives, the mother herself, of course, now uh, thought to be dead. And in this information warfare, it could be one of two things, couldn't it? Either Hamas are saying, look, this baby died because of Israel's bombing, therefore Israel, stop bombing. You're not going to get your hostages, you'll be killing them and potentially killed that baby themselves, or potentially the baby was being moved from house to house and did end up. I mean, no one's ever going to fully know the truth on this. I certainly don't think the mm. public will, but this is the point of the cynical capturing of those hostages. It's for exactly this, and it's, it's evil. And this we've been, well, evil. I'll tell you what, the whole world has been lured into a kind of psychological trap by Hamas, because what you have to remember, we're all going, oh, because they let 10 more, 12 more out yesterday. Yeah. So the hostages are coming out drip, drip, drip. There are still 170 people down there, mm. and there's no way Hamas are going to let them all go because then they've lost all of their bargaining well. chips. So the, when they let 10 out, we all go, great, 10 more came out. But the story continues. Yeah. Uh, and the only thing we can help about, hope about the poor little baby is uh, that this story is not true and he's still alive. Because, as they say, Alex, the first casualty of war is the truth. Well, right? the, the latest tranche are going to be uh, essentially, um, you know, released again today. Uh, Israel saying that there should be 20 more women and children released. And um, the Hamas saying, no, we don't have them. So, uh, I mean, it's just going on and on, this utterly horrific tale of the hostages and how they're being cynically used as pawns. Uh, we have breaking news, by the way, appearing on these magical iPads in front of us. Uh, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson will be giving evidence to the UK COVID-19 inquiry on Wednesday and Thursday next week. There he is, the big Boris himself, who was, of course, king of 10 Downing Street. A lot of fingers of blame have been pointed at him, haven't they, yeah. for sort of well, we knew, mad we knew mismanagement, it was going to be a, COVID yeah. parties. Well, we knew he was going to be an, uh, a, a witness, but now we know the day. Today, of course, uh, it's uh, former Health Secretary Matt Hancock, uh, uh, on the stand. Oh, yeah. So that should be interesting. Uh, he hasn't had a good COVID inquiry so far, but I would argue, uh, nor has anyone else, this is a farce, this inquiry. Well, yeah, and it... it won't examine the proper questions. Was COVID man-made and should we have locked down at all? There's no questioning of lockdowns in this uninquiry un uh, inquiry. It doesn't have a, a spirit of inquiry. It's a joke. But two of the big questions that were asked uh, around the time of COVID and subsequently has been whether or not sending COVID-19, elderly COVID-19 patients oh, yeah. back to care homes, which became nexuses of infection. It swept through care homes uh, like a forest fire, frankly. Um, and actually, Dame Jenny, now head of the UK Health Security Agency, pretty much sort of said that it was entirely clinically appropriate. Well, she didn't, she didn't pretty much. She people. did say it. She yeah. didn't pretty much. She did say it was entirely clinically appropriate to uh, allow or to take uh, old people with COVID 
and put them back into the care homes where they spread that disease to their fellow elderly yeah. residents. She the said that. Would, I mean, for God's sake. But of course, Dame Jenny Harris uh, used to be head of Public Health England, arguably the most ridiculous, ludicrous waste of money this country has ever indulged in. And of course, in. there was one thing that we all liked to um, have a communal thing of during COVID, and that was a big mask debate, yeah, wasn't she, it? She the says big... that they don't, they might, there's no proof that they work. So Jenny Harris, the deputy chief medical officer in the COVID inquiry at a time where we, the British public, were required by law to wear face masks, now announces there's no proof they worked. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. I hated those things. I thought it was utterly militant when you had to sort of get onto a tube and if you didn't have your mask, you could be thrown off. I used to wear one of those flower power lanyards because I get like a bit of face eczema and I was like, I'm not having this horrible sweaty thing yeah. next to my gob. Let's, uh -uh. Have a, let's have a look at uh, Dame Jenny in action at the COVID inquiry. It was a very bleak picture because uh, I think the reality was, this isn't a, an invitation to be discharged in COVID patients, it's actually a reality that says if hospitals overflow, those who can benefit from treatment there will, will be there. Um, anybody, it, it doesn't matter whether it's residential care settings or going home or going on to other ones, that hospitals will have to manage that, that those who are physically well to go will, will yes. go. I just find that breathtaking. I don't know what to say about that. It's OK to send people, old people, with COVID uh, from hospital back to their care homes to infect their fellow elderly residents. Right. Uh, Jenny Harris seems it's to think now. that was OK. In fact, she thought it was entirely appropriate. What, what is... do you think? Uh, tell us later. 03444991000 and no swearing. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So this COVID inquiry, is it veers between farce and shock that these people were making these kind of decisions uh, at, uh, the, in the nation's worst crisis since the Second World War. Uh, yeah. What a mess. What a catastrophe. Oh, yeah. Now, talking about another institution other than the NHS, which is apparently bad for mental health, is the BBC. Of course, the BBC is bad for mental health. But you would be surprised why. Apparently, Nihal Artan... Oh, hold on, I just said Arthur that. Arthur Nayaki. That's all right, we'll go with that. Uh, Arta, 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 Arta Nihaki. Uh, well, do you know what? He's got, maybe used, he's right. I, I used to work a... with Nihal and I can't <laughs> say his second name and I couldn't say <laughs> it oh, God. But he says, he says that walking into the overwhelmingly white working environment of the BBC is affecting his mental health. You know, OK, fine. Uh, but to imagine if somebody said, you know, walking into an office full of people of colour is affecting my mental health. You know, there's, there's a double but what standard. But what is crazy? I mean, he arguably says, this, what he said here, is racist. Well, exactly. He says, it's really affecting me that I walk in and all I see is white people. Now, hold on. Stop press. I used to work at the BBC. The BBC has various schemes where people are sort of, you know, given grants to go to journalism school and hurried through certain sectors and, you know, put in talent pools and identified as stars of the future. And I'll tell you what, if you're white middle class and called someone like Alexandra Phillips, you ain't going to be one of them. Uh, I actually think that most people in journalism would look at the BBC and say it's pretty much the other direction. Now, I actually think that a lot of producers and presenters of the BBC are extremely talented people and they're on merit. I want to make that clear. But when you look at the flagship news programme uh, on the BBC, uh, Radio 4 Today programme, I listen to it every morning, two brilliant Why? presenters. You should well, be li because... What about the Talk TV breakfast show? I have them both on simultaneously, you I'll better. have you know, you because better. I'm a woman and I can multitask. Yeah. But you've got two brilliant presenters there, Michelle Hussein. Oh, um, come off it. She's a very she's, able journalist. She's a, she's a biased lefty. And, and Amol Rajan. And oh, I even think, worse. I like Amol. Yeah. Anyway, I'll stand up for Amol. But what I'm saying is, I think most viewers looking at the BBC, and even those people working inside the BBC, the thought that somehow this is an overly white organisation is insane. I would imagine if you were to do a sort of ratio of diversity in society compared to the diversity of the BBC, <laughs> you would find the BBC massively outweighs well, uh, diversity are, in society. Uh, Nihal is right. There are a lot of white middle class people. But there I, are in the UK. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And as I say, I find it strange that he can go around saying, all oh, these white people, they ruin my mental health. Are they tricking me? They upset if, me? If I went around saying, all oh, these black people, they really ruin my mental health, I mean, I'd be out of here in about three seconds. Double standards. I don't also, I don't understand the rules of these yeah, race I worked, debates. I worked as a journalist in Ghana and I was the only white person in that newsroom and I didn't care at all. Well, 
There you go. Uh, Newsnight, still with the BBC. Newsnight, mm. oh, what a tragedy. Uh, the BBC is uh, slashing costs by £500 million, and that means that Newsnight will be cut to 30 minutes. What a shame they don't cut it to nothing. Uh, but it's going to be cut back to 90 minutes, and uh, incredibly, 60 staff work, work on that unwatched programme. Uh, 30 of them will now be leaving, so a very reduced Newsnight from now on, and about time too. It used to be a seminal programme, particularly Particularly journalists, you should always have watched Newsnight at the end of the day. Now, waste the time. Well, I think the plans are they're going to essentially turn it into a talking shop to have fiery debate to mop up the day's news, as if that doesn't exist everywhere. Well, they do that anyway, frankly, don't they? We do that better, don't we? But um, this is part of £500 million worth of savings. But it seems to me where the BBC are trying to cut costs, instead of cutting costs where it matters, <laughs> Gary Lineker, instead they're targeting their news output. If you're going to do anything as a public service broadcaster, deliver news. They got rid of the news channel, mixed it with BBC world, hold on, aren't you supposed to be paid for by the licence fee payer to give us public information? And that's the exact sector you're attacking, not Gary Lineker, who gives us public rantings and, and ravings. He's negotiating for a pay rise right now, but like, I don't know. I, I, I just think that it would be better uh, if you really want to save money, uh, BBC, Auntie B, but why don't you just cut... Uh, news night altogether. Get rid of it. Nobody watches it. Waste of time. Uh, now, uh, civil servants. Oh, well, right let's then. cut them as well. Now, it's funny, Tell us isn't the it? story. It's a bit like, you know, Dominic Cummings echoed uh, the thoughts of uh, the Trumpian uh, uh, government in in America when he said, well, Whitehall basically needs to be gotten rid of, drain the swamp. What's well, it the seems story? like they're draining themselves, aren't they? Because civil servants are now considering quitting because they've been told they've got to go to the office at least three days a week. Two-fifths of them say they're going to quit because the government has said to them, because they are, in the end, uh, public, uh, they're government employees, the government has said, uh, we need you in the office three days a week. And they said, that's absolutely draconian. We're yeah. going to quit. Well, I've got a better idea. Demand that all civil servants come into the office five, five days, days a, a week, week or you're fired. Yeah. Try that. Try that. Do you remember when Jacob Rees Mogger's office for yeah, yeah, Brexit and turning up to work, whatever it's called, at Mickey Mouse Ministry? left a note saying I uh, dropped yeah. him, but no one was he put, here. He put post it notes. Like, sorry, I missed in you post it all. notes, and they were all traumatized yeah, by yeah, this. He the said, sorry, headmaster. I popped into one of the ministries and said, sorry. I missed you all because the whole place was completely empty. This has to well, stop. This is how, this is where the country is run. Whitehall, the big ministries, yeah. the great offices of state, and there's no one there. No, you know, no wonder that. the country is falling apart at the seams. Make civil servants go to work, into the office, five days a week. That's why I pay my taxes. I don't pay my taxes for them to sit at home watching Netflix. But people have been talking about slimming down the civil service and de-wokifying it for a long time. Well, you know the types of people who, like, get upset and cry over having to go into an office. It's the wokies, isn't it? The sort of lily-livered lefties. Good, leave. We'll replace you with people who know what doing work is like and they're probably right-wing. Yeah, uh, by the way, uh, the producer through my ear just said that we could uh, host Newsnight, so I'm going to rescind my call for Newsnight to be axed. I think it should continue as long as it's hosted we by could, us. But we'll still do crosstalk at 9.30. We could call course. it News Fight. N news Fight, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We'd take the show in a different direction, <laughs> wouldn't we? Uh, oh, cross News, cross as the news, cross say. News, cross News, yeah, new, yeah. Cross News Night, there you go. That's a new show coming up on the BBC, hosted by Kevin O'Sullivan hey. and Alex Phillips very soon. Uh, we're going to take that show... Uh, we're going to lurch it towards the right, maybe. <laughs> But that, well, that wouldn't be very direction. difficult because it's so left-wing and ridiculous. Look, anyway. Kevin, are you ready? Because I'm worried about you. You're getting on in years. You don't have oh, much flesh you. on your bones. Yeah. You live in London, which is about to be the centre of a severe weather uh -huh. emergency. This is what Sadiq Khan, the London mayor... I mean, it is cold out there. Suddenly, London is got, has got very cold. <laughs> it's not snowing or anything like that. It's actually what I would call right. rather a nice day today. Chris Sadiq Khan has declared... Uh, London to be at the centre of, and I quote, a severe right. weather emergency. It is not a severe now, weather emergency. I, I, do you know, I'm going to fact-check this live on it because I'm a bit of a weirdo. Go on, and look, go this on. is how many weather apps I have. I, I love me a weather app. Look at all this. Alex Phillips reveals she's cross, a bit of a weirdo. Look at that, that cross-reference every single weather app. I no, love no. me some weather. So let's have a look. Let's go to Hang the Met second. office. Many... Just, that, just a seven, seven, apps, seven. seven weather apps. You know, you need to check them all, don't you? Yeah, uh, okay. If you're like me. Uh, yeah. Oh, I've got lost it now. There well, we go. They, they now, let's get on. Should we go for Met though? Office? Like this severe okay. weather emergency. Uh, okay. What does what what the, the Met, Met Office, office say? say? For. Hold oh, on, got to get it. It's not going to work. Oh, hold on. Here it is. So uh, it's going to be five degrees 
and three degrees at the coldest. So not even, Just a bit of cloud. So it's not even freezing. Not even point. freezing. Uh, a BBC, we love the BBC and their accuracy. They're always right on everything, aren't they? No. Uh, do our daily news. So hold on, look at this. Saturday, it's got sunshine. Sunshine, look at that. I like these. I mean, these, these, I love these. Be though. careful, you might die. Yeah, I love these wind, like sunny winter days. It's not a severe wedding uh, weather emergency, and it, you know it's got very weird, hasn't it? You know, the sun comes out, and the, the Met Office uh, announces that we're all going to melt. You know, so. You have these terrible alarms in the middle of the summer on nice sunny days. Be careful! Don't leave the house. Draw the curtains. No, it's a sunny day. I'm going to go out, and, you and know, I'm going to go out today as well. And I bet you I don't freeze to death. Basically, this all comes down to lazy teachers, doesn't it? In their unions, where they sort of pray to the gods of snow that their schools will be shut, and parents are like you better be taking my kid. I got work to do. But it's it's just. This is the, the, the establishment, the authorities now, they're catastrophizers. Exactly. You know, so they take a, a slightly cold day, call it a severe wedding. Uh, stop saying wedding for weather, would you? <laughs> a severe weather emergency. And, uh, you know, in the opposite end of the uh, scale in the summer, uh, a nice sunny day, shall we say. Uh, I don't know, 30, 30 degrees or something. They go, oh, God, don't go out and draw the curtains. What is wrong with these people? We used to be able to enjoy nice right. weather. Uh, we used to say, oh, it's cold today, and so on and so forth. I would say if Sadiq Khan wants to know what it's like to operate in sub-zero temperatures, he should sit in this studio of a morning. Yeah, but no, let's we're going to conclude on uh, this. It's a shocking, uh, shocking, almost hilariously shocking story that uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, David Cameron, Lord Cameron, the Foreign Secretary and King Charles will all be attending uh, COP28, uh, absurdly, in Dubai. Uh, <laughs> and they're all going to go there on their own private jets. Yeah, so Just important. Plain hypocrites, as the newspapers are saying. What a joke. And what How I love the most you? is this story that squeaked out that apparently Dubai, the guy who's running this COP28, is the head of one of their big oil companies, and he's already been using it to try and flog some of the yeah, black no, he's, stuff he's doing to oil other deal. states. <laughs> this is what's going to happen at COP28. It will be oh. descended on by hundreds of private jets, just like they always are, yeah. ruining the environment. And uh, when it's in Dubai, they'll be doing oil D deals. Dubai. Dubai I built in the last 30 years in the middle of a yeah. desert peninsula down to yeah. oil wealth. Yeah. Right. Yeah, COP28. Yeah, that sets the scene, doesn't it? Yeah, COP28, saving the planet one oil deal at a time. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Oh, it's this very shocked. believable in the 21st century, but they, there you are. I can't That's wait. Why, I can't wait it? for COP28 because uh, we could do with a bit of comedy. You don't get enough good <laughs> comedy on the telly, do you? Uh, and you'll get all those uh, actors, Leo DiCaprio. Anyway, Greta. that's still to come. But sadly, Alex, for now, we've come to the end of the show. Yeah, thank you for tuning in, but do join us a bit later for our other show. We're going to do it, Kev. Well, Cross -talk. Cross -talk. That's coming up at 1pm. Up next, though, Julia Hartley-Brewer. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV, <laughs> sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, do you 